Our presenter this evening is junior researcher Misty Edgecombe. Misty is a journalist from Maine who has spent the last three years researching and writing small fish, war fatherhood, and the birth of international adoption, the story of her father-in-law's historic adoption from Korea. And you probably all read this, but I have to say it again. Uh, her husband, unfortunately, is working, wasn't able to come, but she heard the story of Jimmy's adoption from her husband, Caleb, on their first date 11 years ago. And the title of her presentation this evening is Small Fish, Searching for Wartime, Soul, and the Birth of International Adoption. Misty, take it away. Thank you. Well, uh, up on the screen here are my main characters. Um, Paul Rayner, who was a U.S. Army soldier here in Korea in 1952 and 1953. And a little boy who he knew as Jimmy, whose name we believe was Che Kyung Kyun, who he ended up adopting and bringing home with him. Um, so I'm here uh, as a creative writing grantee. Um, I think journalism, creative writing shouldn't probably go together most of the time. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit. I apologize, the purple's a little difficult to see, but what my master's degree was in was narrative nonfiction, which is basically using academic, journalistic kinds of research, combining it with a lot of writing techniques from fiction, like scene setting, um, dialogue, and such, um, and then trying to use that to produce um, a book that's factual but readable, so that's, that's the goal. <laughs> um, and as Jim just told you, I learned about this story because it's the story of my husband's family. Um, that's my husband and his dad here in Seoul in April. Um, he had the opportunity to come back and visit Korea for the first time since his adoption. It had been 50, let's see, 53, it's 56 years. Um, and this is with them. And people always ask how much they look alike and how Korean does Caleb's dad look. So I wanted to make sure I showed you a couple photos of him. Um, so that's what got me interested in it, both as I heard it and I thought this is just a great story, just in terms of a journalist who hears the story and thinks this is something that, that people would want to hear about, but also because there's a, a personal connection for me. Um, international adoption, as, as a lot of you probably know, in many legal ways, um, policy kinds of ways started during the Korean War, but there were international adoptions before that, certainly. Um, numbers are hard to come by. I found one researcher who estimates about 300 during um, World War II and the Greek Civil War from Europe. Um, there was no easy way for it to happen in terms of the structure of um, the American visa system, so it's a little bit hard to track the numbers. Um, but that at least gives us an estimate of what we're working with. It happened, it wasn't terribly common. Um, during the Korean War, it became far more common. Um, these figures, again, it's difficult to pin it down because when this all started, it was in the middle of the war. There was very little record keeping. Korea didn't have a system in place to track and oversee this. The United States was hesitant to even allow it to happen, and when it did, you had to do it by special congressional approval. You actually had to get a special um, piece of legislation passed often to get a visa, which I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but these are all numbers that come from uh, news stories around that time. So take them with a grain of salt, but it, again, gives us kind of a, a context. Um, <coughs> an estimate of something like 10,000 children either separated from their families or orphaned living in Seoul. Um, by the mid-50s, about 55,000 kids in 450 orphanages. I've been told that may be a low estimate, but again, hard to pin it down. Um, and over the course of the war, there were at least, I've found, based on news stories, 30 or 40 cases of um, adoptions by soldiers. Some people say the number is more around several hundred. Um, there, there's one researcher who, who came up with a number. Um, but it's, it's something that kind of started in the mid-50s and uh, certainly was, a, was happening with the soldiers. Um, what happened more frequently at the beginning of the war was this idea of children just sort of getting picked up by various units and living with them. Um, sometimes they called them mascots, they dressed them up in little uniforms. Some of these pictures are very odd to look at, um, like this right here. I mean, 
seeing little kids in military uniforms is a little disturbing to me, honestly. Um, and it happened very frequently. And then what would happen when you read the stories in Old Stars and Stripes and, and other papers is these people saying, oh, I wanted to bring him home with me and adopt him, but oh, I'm not married. That just couldn't happen. Um, you hear that kind of comment a lot. Um, eventually, however, it did start to happen. Um, there were four adoptions in 1953 uh, that were formally uh, recognized and on record with the Korean government. One of them was my husband's dad, um, Paul Rainer, adopting uh, Chae Kim Hyun. The other was a little boy who was also adopted by a single man, um, a Navy soldier, a sailor named Vincent Palladino. Um, I've been researching that story as well because they really are contemporaries. Um, Palladino's story ends pretty tragically. Um, he goes through all this trouble to adopt this little boy, flies to Hawaii for a visa, they won't give him the visa, they have to fly back to Seoul. All this chaos to try to make it happen. He gets home to the U.S., living in New York, um, so there was a lot of coverage about it at the Times. He gets married a year later and his wife doesn't like the kid. Uh, so this boy ended up in foster care in New York State. Um, I haven't been able to track him down. I don't know if he changed his name. Um, the adoptive father, I believe, has passed away. I, I found an obituary that I think is him. Um, so I'm, I'm running into dead ends on the story right now, but it's, it's certainly a sad tale. Um, so, but the story I'm focusing on as the, the central example of all these kinds of cases is that of my husband's dad and grandpa. Um, this, who's a pretty typical GI, um, raised in a small town in South Dakota during the Depression, raised by a single mom, which I, I think really plays into some of why he did what he did. Um, he often talked about how angry he was with this child's biological father for abandoning him, and how he, as an American man, was kind of trying to make up for that by taking care of him. Um, he actually enlisted in the Army during World War II, but was released and then was called back as soon as the Korean War started up. Um, arrived in Seoul in August of 1952, um, just as things were starting to calm down. But at that time, they were, this war was still on. They were still under constant threat of, would there be another North Korean attack on the city? Um, it was in that situation that he met the little boy. Um, these are some photos of Seoul at that time. Um, this is what a typical street scene would have been like. I think this was taken in 52. Uh, another picture from Seoul at that time. And this is a lot of what my research is, is trying to get the details right. So looking at a lot of these images. Um, now this is on the, that Yongsan army base, or army garrison. Uh, I was there just last week, actually. Um, they are still using a number of the buildings that were built by the Japanese. And then the US military took them over. The US military came in quickly, built very two buildings. Um, so they were using all these Japanese um, colonial era buildings. Um, but it's, it was very interesting to me to see how many of them are still in use today by the U.S. military. So these are the kind of places where he would have lived and worked. Um, this is, again, Seoul. I believe this one was 51. And um, this is pretty typical of what um, Caleb's grandpa described to me when I interviewed him. The kids who didn't have a place to be would kind of group together and take care of each other. And you'd see kind of little bands of them running around in the street. Um, just kind of watching out for each other. Um, and Caleb's dad was in one of these groups of kids when, when he met him. Um, so this is the night that he took him to live with him. Um, I asked Caleb's grandpa, you know, there are these hundreds of kids in the street, and obviously, you know, if you feel bad about one, you're gonna feel bad for all of them. Why this kid? Why is this the one who you took to live with you? Um, and he talked about how this kid's demeanor was different. Um, a lot of the kids, when the American soldier came out, they'd run away. They were afraid of him. This kid just kind of stared at him, and he spoke a little bit of English. Um, we found out later he had had an American father who had lived with him for a period of time. He picked up a little of the language. And then also, Caleb's grandpa said, when he looked at this kid, there was something physically about him that he reminded him of his nieces and nephews in the United States. Um, he was a little lighter haired, his eyes were a little different in shape, his build was a little different. I mean, there's nothing huge. He looks, I mean, I'd be interested in everyone telling me if he looks like a Korean kid or an American kid or 
can you spot that he's biracial or what? Um, but something about him just made him say this kid doesn't belong in this situation. And from what he learned about the culture here in the city at the time, that this kid wouldn't have much of a chance as a biracial kid, child of a soldier, trying to live here in Seoul. Um, so Christmas Eve of 1952, he snuck him into the barracks. Um, absolutely not permitted. There was a curfew. No Koreans were allowed to post after curfew for fear of North Korean spies. He snuck him in. Um, eventually got busted and got caught. Um, had a scary moment where he thought he was going to be court-martialed for this because there were instances where people were pretty severely punished for doing things like having secret marriages, sneaking people into the, the barracks. Um, but ultimately, he met a colonel who helped him out and let this little boy live with him in uh, Seoul City Command, the building where he worked. Um, that's uh, one of Caleb's grandma's friends. Um, this was at Incheon, sometime in the winter of early, well, early, you know, January, February of 53. Um, and he had, actually, it shows in that picture, he had this little flak jacket that they had made into child size that he used to wear around. Um, this is in front of the PX here in Seoul. Um, it's amazing how many pictures you see of little Korean kids running around in cowboy outfits at that time. It was like the thing that they all wanted. Um, cowboy movies, you know, were hugely popular in the early 50s, and that's how Caleb's dad learned a lot of his English, actually, was watching cowboy movies. Again, that was another friend of Caleb's grandpa. This is uh, a drawing that Caleb's dad made when he was living at Seoul City Command sent back to his, his new grandma in the States. Um, there's a really funny letter that accompanies this with this weird, weird Korean crossed with Japanese crossed with English slang syntax um, that I use some of in the piece I'm going to read. Um, so I'm going to show you that. Actually, Caleb's dad grew up to be an artist, so that's why I really like this. <laughs> um, so when the time came for Caleb's grandpa to go home, for Paul Rayner to head home, he kind of originally just wanted to take care of the kid, maybe give some money to someone to send him to school, find a place for him at an orphanage. Over time, more and more decided, maybe I just want to bring him home with me, maybe I want this to be my son. Um, but that was extremely difficult to accomplish in 1952 if you were a single man. Um, American immigration law at that time was tremendously racist. Um, there was a policy in the Immigration National League after 1952 that started basically in the 1920s that was aimed at keeping Chinese immigrants out of the United States that limited, severely limited the number of visas for people from this part of the world. And there's this crazy long list of all these people who are not allowed into the United States. It's just unbelievable when you look at it. Um, criminals, stowaways, prostitutes, um, the feeble-minded, beggars, paupers. And then my favorite is how it says you can't have a physical disability that will keep you from earning a living, and then right after it, it says you can't seek to enter the U.S. to work in skilled or unskilled labor. So you can't not want to work, but you can't want to work either. Um, so this is what he was dealing with when he set out to try to get a visa. Um, it just wasn't going well at all. Um, because of that, he ended up getting rotated home at the end of the war, um, and he did not have the proper documents to bring the boy with him. So when he left in July of 1953, he left Jimmy in the care of Grace Rue at the Seventh-day Adventist Orphanage on the outskirts of Seoul. Um, Grace had been a friend of Paul's. They worked together to basically steal um, <laughs> excess food from the army and sneak it over the orphanage to feed the children there. Um, so Paul lived in this house right here with Mrs. Rue. And then this right here was the hospital. Where, and then over here were the buildings where the children lived. This picture is from the early 1960s, um, and then you'll see the rice fields here in front of it that play into something I'm going to talk about later. This is that same place today. It's now the campus of um, the medical center, semi Medical Center, for all the medicine and the Adventists. And the Bruce house is still there, uh, as is the hospital, which is now a maternity ward. So it's pretty cool I get to go visit um, that while I've been here in Korea. Um, this was 1953 at the Seventh-day Adventist Orphanage where uh, Caleb's dad was staying. These pictures were taken after he left, though. He wouldn't have been living there when these pictures were taken. He left about a month earlier. So he's not in any of these photos. Um, 
pretty typical of a lot of the facilities from, at that time, from what I understand. They got some support from the military. People did bring boxes of donations. A lot of support from like-minded people here in Korea, um, and basically made do with what they could get. Um, and that was, this was in 1951, right in the middle of the war, they were operating. Um, the reason the adoption actually went through is because this is, let's see, I'm going to mix them up, aren't I? Well, anyway, this is Dr. Ru, and this is Sigmund Rhee, and their wives. Mm -hmm. And they were friends. Um, Dr. Ru was Sigmund Rhee's personal physician, and the only reason this adoption went through is because Paul gave the adoption papers, or the, the, the documents that he needed to have the adoption approved here in Korea to Mrs. Ru, who gave them to her husband, who brought them to a medical appointment. Um, that's, it, it was extremely difficult to get things done. That was basically the only reason it happened, which is why there were so few early on. So uh, he had left in the uh, summer of 1953 and hadn't realized it, but at that same time, the U.S. Congress was solving this problem. There was a piece of legislation passed then that created a special category of visas for orphan children who were refugees, and Jimmy fit the status, and he got one of the first visas under this program. Um, and then the creation of this program um, led to a lot of military people adopting, started getting a lot of visibility in the states, spurred people like the Holtz, who were one of the first civilian families to adopt, and it really started the ball rolling. That's why I talk about this as being the birth of international adoption. It's not that it didn't exist before this, but it really snowballed at this point. Um, and these like, pieces of legislation were a big part of why. Mm -hmm. That one's really slow. Um, now, we recently have been able to get a hold of some documents that are really exciting. Um, we got Caleb's dad's immigration file from the U.S. Um, Department of Homeland uh, Security. And the document on the right is the family registry that was created so that he could be adopted. It lists only him. No, no mother's name listed. The document on the left is testimony from a woman who claimed to have taken care of him. Um, the story that I heard from Caleb's grandpa is that he was living with a prostitute who lived across the street from Seoul City Command. She was sleeping with an MP, so that's why she was allowed to, to stay in business where she was. Um, and the MP kind of facilitated this, that she didn't really want to, wasn't really taking care of the kid. He, he kind of ran wild. Um, supposedly, she didn't say much about him leaving. We don't know how true that was, if the MP pressured her, if I mean, I read a little bit about it. We don't know if she thought of him as her child or not. Um, it's hard to imagine that she wouldn't if she took him in, but uh, I don't know her, well, I don't think I know her name. That's why this is so exciting. Um, the translation of this says that it's a statement from a woman named Wang Young Soon, um, who claimed that she had taken care of him since 1951. And this is where uh, Caleb's grandpa heard the story of the child's birth. Um, she says that she took him in um, January of 51, right before the North Koreans were coming back, um, and took care of him from then. Um, let's see, she says he was wandering in the street. Um, could have been peace times, one might have taken care of him, but everyone was trembling with horror because of the sounds and effects of the shells, tanks, and the equipment. And then she goes on to say that she claims to have run into his 78-year-old grandmother in the market, um, who told her that his father had been an American soldier, that his mother had been killed by the North Koreans the first time they came into the city for her relationship with the enemy, and that she couldn't take care of him because of her age. Um, my focus between now and when I leave Korea is trying to figure out what the heck to make of this. Was this something she was paid to say to make the adoption happen? Is this it, how much truth could there be to this? Is this the prostitute? And she just, you know, obviously didn't want that on the record and said that she did something else. She claims she's a rice dealer in this document. Um, I'm trying to, to work with some people to pin down at least did a woman of this name and age exist um, so that we can try to figure out how much truth there is to this. Um, it's certainly an exciting story, but so many of the documents at that time were just completely falsified um, that it's, it may or may not reveal any truth. Um, as far as I'm concerned right now, disproving anything is probably
probably as useful as proving anything. It all gets me closer to the reality. But this is the story that Caleb's grandpa heard and the truth that he was operating from. This is what he believed to be the truth. Dollars. 
Rainer sometimes sends money so Jimmy can treat himself to grapes and gum in the marketplace. He sends letters and kisses from Jimmy's new grandma. He'll have a bed of his own and a bike to ride at the American house, Rainer says. American boy, American house, number one. Jimmy repeats the words to his friends with a broad grin and a puffed up chest. He writes them in letters to his new number one grandma, putting his faith in the carefully penciled words. He likes the way they sound. They sound like Rainer. It's easy enough to slip through the orphanage gate and scramble down the hill. With hundreds of children in their care, none of the nurses notice one less stomach to fill, one less grubby face to wash. The orphanage is overrun with the human cost of war. The mixed race GI babies whose mother give in, mothers give in to poverty or pride and leave their burdens by the roadsides or at marketplaces, tucked into wicker baskets like cabbages. Mrs. Grace Rue, who runs the orphanage, finds them on the doorstep. Some, like Jimmy, have the wrong kind of eyes. Others are marked by blonde hair or freckles, or fuzzy black curls and skin that's just a shade too dark. Sent to Father's country, one mother said. Maybe someday, when bombed out roads have been mended and civilian airplanes are again flying across the Pacific, maybe then government officers will be willing to listen to a missionary nurse. But for now, Mrs. Rue's orphanage will have to do. Rice fields flank the squat utilitarian brick buildings of the sole sanitarium and hospital orphanage, and its eight acres of gardens on the outskirts of the city where nearly 300 unwanted children tend sweet potatoes and soybeans and row upon row of leafy greens for hundreds of gallons of conquered kimchi. The city is a steely blur in the distance, and beyond, ancient humpback gray-blue gray hills embrace the plain that explodes with rotten growth. It feels safe, protected. Jimmy likes being outside. He can breathe outside. He isn't used to long aisles of beds tacked tight, packed tight with two or three boys to a bunk. He hates waking at night to the sharp smell of urine from a dozen wet mattresses. He pulls his blanket tight over his ears to drown out the midnight terror of a dozen boys and girls reliving a very grown-up war, and he tries to think about America. Everyone there is big, like Rainer, and Gary Cooper, and John Wayne. They all wear cowboy hats when they ride their horses and drive their cars. They only take baths when they feel like it. They eat as much spam and chocolate as they want when they go home to their big houses. They read funny books and watch movies and smoke cigarettes. They don't have worms in their bellies or bugs in their hair. They never wet the bed. They aren't scared of anything. When the sirens would scream and Jimmy had to run through the streets with his helmet and canteen to sit in a foxhole, hugging his knees close and eating crackers out of his mess kit until Rainer came to tell him that everything was okay, he wished that he could be big and brave. There's a hillside near the orphanage where the dirt rises above Jimmy's shoulders and he can look right into the deep dark holes between the rocks. The oldest boys say that snakes live in those holes and they dare each other to plunge their hands deep inside. When the big boys are around, Jimmy throws his shoulders back and walks tall and slow, sauntering along like Rainer in his uniform. When he's alone, he runs as fast as he can, skidding on gravel and looking straight ahead down the path. He doesn't want to see any snakes. Sometimes, Jimmy wakes very early and sneaks out of bed, moving gently so he makes no noise like an Indian in the movies. He stalks the perimeter of the long, narrow brick building where the boys sleep, one slow step at a time, Tokyo, Tokyo, to muffle the crackling grass, searching the ground for his little birds. Swallows live in the shadow of the flat roof, streaky brown and white birds, no bigger than a man's fist. The babies just fit into his cupped palm. He finds one every few days, a limp little ball of feathers that fell from its nest when it tried to fly. He hides it in a box and feeds it bits of grass and rice left over from his breakfast. He strokes its downy back and whispers softly, trying to tell the little bird how to fly away. But it's no use. They always die and leave him alone. Someday soon, he won't be alone. Rainer will come back. Jimmy tries to remember how long he's been gone. When he squeezes his eyes shut, he can picture his friend leaning over the door of his Jeep for one last hug and explaining that he had to go back to his country, America, for a while so that Jimmy's country, Korea, would let them live together. He remembers how Rainer waved and smiled and said he would come get him and bring him to America. Rainer promised he'll come back. Jimmy just wishes he knew when. Last week, an orphanage kid was adopted, a Tuki, a half-breed like Jimmy, a boy with Korean eyes and fiery orange hair that makes people's mouths fall open when they see him in the marketplace. He had a whole new pile of clothes and toys, and then he disappeared. All the other boys tell Jimmy they want to be adopted. Jimmy wonders if he wants to be adopted, too. Adopted. He rolls his tongue around the strange word. He's not sure what it means, but he knows it brings new shoes and little metal cars and candy. Maybe it's better than America. Um, so he, 
he was in this situation where he, he had faith that his friend was coming back, but no one had ever come back for him. Um, and he didn't understand what adoption was. He didn't actually know he'd been adopted at that point. Um, so it was all, all very confusing for him. Um, I want to show you a couple little video clips um, that I forgot because I was <laughs> zooming through my PowerPoint. Um, these are both um, pieces from the 1950s that I found um, from various different places online. Of course, I can't get up on the screen. Anyway, one of them is a propaganda movie produced by the Marines in 1951. Um, by the voiceover, it is very clear <laughs> that it's a propaganda movie. Um, sometimes to the point of being really funny. Um, but the video is really interesting. Um, this was about an hour and a half long. I cut it down to three and a half minutes, and it's just the parts that focus on children. filmed in 50 and 51, according to the narrative about it. Well, while this is coming up, I'll tell you about the other one as well. Um, the second. And this is Korea, a peaceful land once with lakes and villages and mountains where the rice grew. Men and women worked and people lived for living until the ruthless spread a hand of communism reached out to snatch it. Old people, and kids, and more kids. Sometimes I think that's the last thing any of us will ever forget. Those kids, laughing, crying, homeless, hungry, where the kids used to play.
decided it has a mission. <laughs> um, but it does show you just how much, even at that time, early on, 50 and 51, these children were involved with the soldiers, and the, the fate of these children was something that the military was talking about. Um, I'm going to show you one more. Um, this was a newsreel from the mid-1950s. Under President Cleveland heads into port, and on board is a happy little Korean orphan, five-year-old Kim Ku Pilyu. He's got his passport, he's got a new home in America, and he's got new parents, too. Airman Bill Pond, veteran of the Korean fighting, and Bill's mother. Bill befriended the youngster on the field of Rome, and now, after months of complications and delay, brings him home to peaceful America. Home is right from the heart. So that's sort of typical of the earliest situations um, because it was very difficult for a single man to adopt a lot of these soldiers, either the parents adopted the children or if they were married, they were able to do so. A lot of the early examples that I found from 52 and 53 are either married men or very frequently men whose parents then adopted these children and became their brothers, the adopted brothers and sisters. Um, let's see, it's about 7.43, do you want me to Go into questions or read more or what? <laughs> How would you like to do this? Any preferences from the audience? I guess, do you we like have one? questions? That's, yeah. <laughs> that's a good way to figure it out. I think we can take questions. Sure. documents to verify or disprove anything that I got out of interviews is, is really critical. Um, and we had some really futile trips to the local office to try to get a hold of it, but we didn't know the mother's name, didn't know where he was born, we didn't have the address. You know, and we're talking to this very kind woman and a young man is translating for us and she's kind of kind of laughing and saying, you know, it's going to be hard if you don't have the mother's name and the address. And she's like, what's the father's name? We said, well, he was an American soldier. And she said, <laughs> this just isn't going to work. <laughs> you weren't able to locate the portrait here, but you got it through the state. Exactly. Yeah, so now that we actually have, I mean, it's not a great photocopy, but a translation and that, we have enough to go request it here, which we're definitely going to do, because I know for Caleb's dad, having a copy of that would mean a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
can you get that here? I mean, is, is that open information? Um, I believe anyone can go get their own as long as they have the right information to ask for it. No, I got it. Um, does any, I, I believe as long as you have birth family name and the address where your birth would have been recorded, you can. Um, but I know for a lot of adoptees, they either can't get that information or it, it's somewhat tricky. Yeah. It's been really hard for some people. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, so much of your research seems like it, it's um, dedicated to interviewing um, Caleb's father and grandfather. Um, it's um, really sensitive issues. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, why, if you could talk a little bit more about what the response has been like to you taking on this project um, and writing this book. Um, yeah, he was asking about the response from Caleb's family in talking about these sensitive issues and, and putting it out there in, in this form. Um, they both were very supportive of, of the idea, Caleb's dad and his grandpa. Um, when I lived in Oregon, we lived an hour, or hour and a half or so from where Caleb's grandpa was living. So I interviewed him extensively for about a year and a half. Um, and that's kind of my starting point for everything. And then I've been interviewing other Korean War veterans. I've been you know, reading testimony at the, the National um, Archives has a great uh, veterans testimony section where you can read a lot of stuff. Um, it took a while to work up to the sensitive issues. Actually, when I started researching this story, I knew very few details. I just knew that the adoption had happened in Korea, and that it was kind of early, and that it was a single man, and wow, that's really unusual. Just kind of left it at that. And there were some crazy stories circulating in the family that were completely untrue about, like, um, Caleb's dad saving Caleb's grandpa from a communist bomb or something. It, it's, I was going to read that section, but I read it out of time. And the truth of the story is that they were walking on a dark street, and the little boy heard some people in Korean talking about mugging the soldier, and he understood, and the, the, the adult didn't, and he told him. Um, so it was a very different story than this crazy, you know, told through six people bomb story that I had heard. Um, I suspected at the outset that he was actually Paul's biological child and that he just didn't want to admit it. Um, but since I got Paul's military records, um, pretty much have disproved that he wasn't in Korea early enough for that to be possible. Um, but asking questions like that, um, it took five or six months of interviewing before I got to those questions. Um, I had never met Caleb's grandpa before, um, so I'm, it, it really wasn't that different for me coming in and interviewing anybody in that sense, because I had no prior relationship. Um, so yeah, definitely working up to the questions about, well, did you sleep with this prostitute? And <laughs> which he says he didn't, um, but a lot of his friends did. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it was very interesting. Um, Caleb's dad is very excited about the idea of this being down on paper for Caleb and his sisters and for our children someday. Um, my intent is to publish something that would be commercially available. If I'm not successful in doing so, I'll probably still maybe put it out there for our family in some form. Um, Caleb's grandpa was very supportive of the idea of us coming here. Um, he actually passed away in April. Um, so we're not going to be able to, to come back and show him all the stuff that we've collected, which is, is really difficult. But um, he, when we said goodbye to him, it was, it was a good goodbye. Yeah, he was really pleased to have us come. Uh, Rachel. Yes. And are these kinds of adoptions, are they still going on in the same way, or have uh, are they, or are adopt international adoptions mainly through agencies now? I I don't believe there are adoptions going on outside agencies very frequently today. Yeah, um, I I had the same question just to repeat and maybe rephrase the question. Have you done any research into um, Adoption trends. I mean, we heard about the very first right. adoptions from you, but do you know what the pattern has been like? Yeah, I should put it into context. I've, I've read about it for that purpose. Um, I I want this book to stand as a picture of what was happening at that time, how it started, what some of those factors were that created this situation. I think anyone interested in, in current trends would find some of the similarities striking of the way certain things are still similar, certain things continue, um, certain, you know, faking of documents and um, certain cultural views from both sides that maybe weren't helpful. <laughs> um, 
I think so I'm, I've been reading a lot and trying to do some research into to more contemporary stuff. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost what the question was. <laughs> well, well, I'm just was curious whether you'd looked into uh, what the oh, patterns have been, the, the, like even tracing the absolute number. We were talking initially yeah. about hundreds. I think the number, the number that I usually see cited begins in the late 50s and goes up to the current day. And I know there's several people in the audience who've researched this, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's somewhere around 200,000 globally. Is that, is that right? I'm seeing some nodding, okay. Um, and that's to the United States and Europe and Australia and Japan and all over the world. Um, so it's what started with these four in 1953 has come to be a huge group of people all over the world. Um, at the very beginning, a lot of the children were biracial and that was part of the reason why they were being adopted because of people like Caleb's grandpa who felt this connection to a biracial kid that you know, maybe he didn't feel as much to some of the other children, which suggests some of, you know, his background of, of perhaps his racial beliefs or, you know, his upbringing. Um, that certainly was the case at the beginning. But that only lasted for, um, you know, the first few years that, um, I can't remember the year, which I've read about it shifting, but certainly by the 1970s, I believe it was mostly 100% Korean children. Yeah, some of us, uh, some of us who were here in Peace Corps, took uh, Holt adoptees back. Mm -hmm. I remember I did uh, on my return to the United States. That was an adventure. Yes, I didn't do it. Did you? Oh no. Uh, did you have a I've question? I've actually interviewed though? some people who did that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I yes. Yeah. Well, oh. This gets beyond, uh, I guess, the, the, the situation in Korea. I'm just curious what it was like for a mixed race child who grew up in here on South Dakota. It was certainly difficult. Um, it, it's very. Oh, I'm sorry. You're asking what it was like for a mixed race child to grow up in a rural, you know, here on South Dakota in the 1950s. How big is here? Um, it's decent sized today. I think it's like. I'm terrible with numbers, as you can see. I'm a work person, and I can't remember numbers to save my life. Um, it's a small city today. Twenty to thirty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, it was. I much grew up in a water town, which oh, is not far. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. It, at that time, it was much more rural, though. Um, a lot of farmers. Uh, there was a railroad town. Um, they only lived there for a year, partially because it wasn't easy. Um, actually, before Caleb's grandpa, before Paul came to Korea, he had sat down to say goodbye to his family. And his uh, brother-in-law, who he describes as a, a, a big fat ass, <laughs> actually, he's not fond of his brother-in-law, um, made the comment, uh, quote, are you going to bring home a little slopey to him? And he never thought about it again until he was in the process of adopting this child. And it was like, oh, God, I'm bringing this kid into this family. Um, and this is the situation, you know, of what he's going to be facing. Um, people, there were kind people who tried to help, but they certainly weren't familiar with the idea of either a single father or a mixed race family. Um, there was a lot of saying the wrong thing in an attempt to be kind. Um, and then there were the people who were just, you know, completely um, unaccepting. Um, they ended up moving to California, actually, when the little boy was uh, in the second grade. And then spent much of his childhood in Oregon, um, in Portland, Oregon. Um, Caleb's grandpa got married when Jimmy was about 12 years old. Um, he had actually a good relationship with his stepmom. In this case, it worked out. Um, and they ended up adopting three other children um, while they were together. He was career military. Um, they spent much of, um, pardon me, Caleb's dad's teenage years in Austria. So he has two Austrian sisters. And he has another brother who's Korean as well, um, who Caleb's grandpa adopted while he was stationed here during the Vietnam War. So his brother is about 10 years younger than him. Um, it's interesting, Caleb's dad had never researched his story a lot. He's talked to his dad about it, but had never done the kind of research that I've been doing. Partially because he didn't really know how to start. Um, partially, I think he just was a little bit afraid to take that step. Um, his brother has no interest whatsoever in coming to Korea, learning anything about Korea. It's, they were raised in the same family, but they just have very different views of the whole issue. Um, I mean, he's supportive of what we're doing. He's a great guy, but he, as far as he's concerned, he just doesn't want to know. Um, yeah. Okay, yes. Um, I was um, just surprised that the early adoption
question of Korean war orphans was such a difficult affair, um, I thought that lots of Korean war orphans were adopted by American soldiers during the war. But apparently, it was not the case. And then, in 1953 and 54, those two important uh, legislation um, happened, right? And you described it as the birth of international adoption. So in that process, in that legislative uh, process, did uh, the voices of soldiers uh, in Korea who wanted to adopt Korean kids matter? I mean, did that kind of influence or some kind of dynamics yeah. between the two? Um, I just had a question about whether what was happening um, with the soldiers wanting to adopt had anything to do with the changes in legislation. Um, I definitely believe that it did. Um, every time one of these soldiers tried to adopt, they were calling their congressmen. They were trying to get these special resolutions passed. And if you had the right connections, you got it passed and you brought the child home. Um, it certainly was an issue that was being raised um, out among um, representatives. Um, and then eventually when this was introduced, a lot of those people who had that experience were more likely to support the legislation. Um, there definitely were other factors as well. There were other things going on. Um, the whole idea of you know, policy with related anything having to do with Korea was all tied up in the Cold War, and it was all tied up in we're saving these children from being communists. And there was certainly a lot of that rhetoric involved. Um, actually, it's really interesting that list I showed you from the old law said you can't be a communist or an anarchist or have affiliated with them in any way. On one of the documents we got from the Immigration Service, it has not communist scrawl. No. It's really big letters on a five-year-old's immigration <laughs> papers. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch out for those five-year-old communists. <laughs> yeah. and, and that, uh, we were just talking earlier today, that wasn't really broken down, that Cold War, until basically the Seoul Olympics. The Northern policy under No Te U, uh, a year or so before the Seoul Olympics, started the process of uh, reestablishing contact with all those countries, the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, China, Vietnam. Uh, one or two more questions, and then we'll yeah. Yes, Jen. Well, um, I was really interested in the picture that you had um, Juxtapose of um, Caleb's father um, fishing and then the one of him visiting and Caleb um, back in, it was in this year? Mm -hmm. Or um, I was just wondering, um, during his father's visit, how much did that bring back for him that he maybe not did for him before that? Or what kind of things did he experience that kind of helped him Yeah, um, I don't think, oh, I'm sorry, she was asking about when Caleb's dad came back to visit in April and what that experience was like for him. Um, I don't think it was a matter of necessarily triggering memories. Um, I, there was nothing that came back like a jolt. I mean, we were, we were sort of hoping that would happen. That would have been great research <laughs> um, I was curious to see if he'd come here and like suddenly remember some words, you know, or, because he spoke Korean fluently. He spoke Japanese pretty close to fluently until um, he was five years old, and then he just stopped speaking it, and now, he really doesn't remember any, although his wife claims that he speaks a strange language in his sleep. <laughs> um, she thinks when he dreams, he speaks Korean. And we're, I've never witnessed it, so I, don't, I can't say, but there's a possibility there. Um, it was a very emotional experience, in part because he arrived only a week after his adoptive father died. Um, that wasn't what we had counted on. Um, so that fishing trip that Caleb and his dad took together um, was south of here in the mountains. They, they went along with a, a guide who went trout fishing. Um, ended up being sort of a way for them to mourn together and to work through it. Um, had a lot of good conversations and actually I did learn a little bit more about um, memories and such through that. One of the really interesting things that, that came out is that Caleb's dad I mentioned is an artist. He was a painter for a lot of years. And um, he used to paint these landscapes that didn't look quite like anywhere he'd lived. I mean, he thought he imagined them, and but they'd always kind of like shapes of rocks and things that appear in his work. When they went south of here into the mountains, he saw landscapes that basically are what he's been painting. Um, so deep down in somewhere, he's remembering that, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, so we also went to the War Memorial, the, the um, National with the museum oh, out near Yongsan. And uh, there's a, if you've ever been, there's an exhibit that's something like, 
experience, the refugee experience, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's about life and soul during the war. You walk through this weird little alleyway thing that's like, the fact that all the people are three quarters size is kind of creepy to me. I feel like a giant in this world, but there's like sound and there's little dioramas and stuff and the kinds of houses people lived in. And, and as you walk through, you're supposed to kind of like see what life was like. And he, um, that was hard for him. He said they did a pretty good job of, of creating that. Um, we walked through, there's a lot of images of children on the street, a lot of video and such that I've actually been using in my research, and, and uh, I think we all cried a little bit <laughs> that day. Um, that was, was really emotional for him. Um, but it was an experience that he really wanted to have, so, yeah. Okay, one final question then. Yeah. Um, have you looked into what the other United Nations soldiers were doing, say the French soldiers or the Tur Turkish soldiers, were they adopting these children also, or? Um, I ought to look into that. Oh, I'm sorry. She was asking about whether um, UN soldiers from elsewhere were adopting these children. I know they were fathering some of these children, um, just like the U.S. soldiers were. Um, most of my research has been based around American media. Um, a lot of these reports of early adoptions that I have come from the archives of Stars and Stripes, Time, Life, New York Times. I've gone through a lot of the major uh, media because these stories did get a lot of attention at home. Um, kind of as as propaganda efforts. Look at these great soldiers doing this great stuff. But for me, it's very helpful. Um, I have not done that research in European media, so it's possible there are accounts of these kinds of adoptions in you know British papers or just in Australia. I think it'd be very interesting to find out. You know, just an interesting, just a thought. I just learned that Google has now scanned 10 million volumes, including. And those are available on Google Book Search. You know, you may not have a, an actual book show up in many cases, but it might be an avenue for, uh, for, for looking into that. Thank you, uh, Misty, for a very, very interesting